So the guy goes out, looks through a field, and he's like, oh, man, there is a gold nugget right there. Tell you what, son, I done found me something here, boy. Let's get, hey, I'm fixing to go get me a loan. I'm going to buy this, because it is, but I got a plan. I'm going to get her done. He goes, gets his stuff situated. After he found his treasure, buys it, you know, digs it up, whatever, buys the land, replants it. But here's the catch. He sold everything he had to get that bought. And then he's happier than a, man, that's, I had a saying pop in my head. Happy as a lark about that. He was happy as a lark. That's what the Lord's saying. He's like, I'm not, he's not saying get rid of everything you got and then, and then go forth and preach the gospel. But if that's what he tells you to do, then by all means do it. But that's not necessarily in, in our time. It's tough to do that. It really is. But what he's saying is what you are allowed, the time you that's not occupied, maybe use that for this. And then, you know, the Lord will bless it just as sure enough as I'm sitting here, fat, dumb, and happy. It's all good, man. So good to see you. I'm so good to be back. Um, I don't know. I think I, look, I could listen to him <laughs> tell stories all day. That was really good. Uh, if we've never met, my name is James Brown. Um, Godfather of souls, I guess, uh, as well. Thank you for putting that on there. Uh, if we've never met, though, uh, I used to be on staff here as one of the pastors not too long ago, and if you were part of the church when I left, you know that, that the reason for my departure uh, was directly related to uh, my wife's breast cancer diagnosis, and uh, I'm happy to say uh, that things are going well. With that, uh, we've got one more surgery coming up uh, next week uh, that, that sort of is like the last uh, moment in this chapter for us. And so thank you so much for your prayers. I can't can't tell you how much that means. Um, yeah, it meant, it meant a lot. And I, I would say, needless to say, uh, the last eight months for us has, has been an absolute adventure. Uh, but, but honestly, that shouldn't have surprised me. Uh, our, our marriage, our life together ha has always been full of the unknown, has always been sort of full of adventure. Actually, adventure has been one of our relationship themes from, from the very beginning. And in fact, as I think back, uh, uh, about 10 months into our marriage, uh, we were finally able to take our very first weekend trip together. Uh, as a pastor, you can imagine I work most Sundays, so it's often difficult to get away for a weekend. Uh, but on this particular weekend, because we lived around the Twin Cities area in Minnesota, we decided to head north to the, to, to the top of Minnesota. And since we were trying to travel on the cheap at that time, Jenna, my wife, hopped onto Priceline.com, which in no way is sponsoring the sermon, just so we're clear. Uh, as you'll find out shortly, uh, and found out, and she found some sweet deals, some sweet deals for the second and third night of our trip, but she could find absolutely nothing, zero, for that first night. And so we, and when I say we, I mean she, decided that we were going to go camping, uh, which sounds like a great idea, right? I mean, it's a good alternative, except for the fact that I'm not, I'm not really an outdoorsy kind of person. Uh, tr truth be told, I prefer my bed to the ground, I prefer sitting on porcelain to the bumper dumper, which if you, if you don't know what that is, it's basically what it sounds like. Um, I prefer the light of my big screen television to the rays of the sun, which is why when Jenna said that we would be camping for the first night of our trip, I had a feeling like this little excursion was going to quickly turn into Jenna and James' most excellent adventure. And uh, I was not wrong. I was not wrong. Now, since we didn't have a, a tent, we didn't bring a tent into our uh, most holy union, we had to borrow one. We borrowed one from her dad, or as I like to call him, Super Wayne, Super Wayne. And I call him that because this guy literally has everything you could ever need or ever want in his garage. So he, once we told him we were going, he gave us a giant duffel bag of tent supplies and said this, I quote, there should be a tent in there Set it up and make sure you have everything you need. 
Sure thing, no problemo, super Wayne. Um, so three days leading up to the trip, Jenna's sister started calling her every day and telling her, hey, did you set up that tent yet? You should really set it up and make sure that you have everything you need. And she would tell me this and I would assure my beloved bride that everything's gonna be okay because Super Wayne would never ever send us out into the wilderness with anything less than everything we need. And so with that uh, trust and faith in mind, we left on Friday morning for Northern Minnesota to make sure that we got there in enough time to find a camping spot. But unfortunately, once we got there, there were none, zero, not a single space to be had. Uh, we made it uh, all the way to one of the state parks at the top of the state. We were kind of zigzagging between state parks to find a place and our last option we stopped at before we were gonna turn into squatters in front, somebody's front yard. And so we, we were there and we were hoping and God must have been smiling on us in that moment because the park receptionist informed us that they had exactly one spot available uh, for us uh, because the family that was in front of us decided to leave right as we were arriving. And I thought to myself, where God guides, he provides. Okay, so we headed to the spot. It was absolutely beautiful. It was surrounded by thick tree, thick, thick wooded air. It was beautiful. Nobody in sight. And so Jenna, my wife, started pulling out the food and kind of organizing that part of the deal. And then it was my turn, my part, to set up the tent. So I pulled out uh, Super Wayne's giant duffel bag and I unzipped the top. And as I pulled out the last tent peg in the bag, my heart sank because there was no tent, right? <laughs> there, there were plenty of tent poles, uh, many poles that had obviously come from a variety of other tents. Uh, there were even lots of pegs, enough actually to set up about a half a dozen tents. There was even a rain cover for the tent, but the absence of what we needed the most was painfully, and I would say embarrassingly, absent. Um, now, being a newlywed, I wasn't exactly sure how my wife would react to this ignorant oversight by me, uh, but fortunately, she was happy to go with the flow and even mildly uh, expressed impressive, uh, that she was impressed when I presented her with our accommodations for this evening, which looked like this. Uh, I made use of that tent flap. Uh, and so that was the night before. And then the next morning, this was kind of the situation. She's sleeping there. And, and we'd put those chairs to keep the bears away. <laughs> yeah, that was going to work. Um, you're like, great, great story. What's that have to do with Jesus? Um, I'll get, hold on. Um, I, I share this story with you because I learned a very powerful lesson that day, um, which is this. This is the lesson I learned. That it never hurts to take a second look at something you already think is true. That, that it never hurts. It never hurts to take another look at something you already think you know. Why? Well, because you might discover that you are actually missing something very important. And that something that you're missing well, it might just change everything. And if you never look, you'll never know. Now, that lesson is extremely helpful when it comes to Super Wayne and, he, and he's giving you a giant duffel bag of tent supplies. It's extremely helpful. But I also think it's incredibly valuable when you're digging into the three verses that we're gonna be looking at today. That these three verses that we're gonna be looking at, they comprise two teeny tiny little parables that Jesus told. And my goal today is to help you see these stories from a different perspective, to see these parables from, from another angle, maybe a view that you've possibly never considered before. And so I want to show you these parables right now. So if you have a Bible or a Bible app with you, I want to invite you to join me in Matthew chapter 13. Matthew chapter 13. Uh, we are in this series called uh, Summer Stories where we're looking at different parables that Jesus told and pulling out uh, nuggets of wisdom and insight from them. And so we're nearing the end of the chapter. There's one more week of the series, I believe, that we'll talk about the last parable in this chapter, but this is the second to last set of parables. And it starts in verse 44. 44 says this, the kingdom of heaven is like a treasure hidden in a field. When a man found it, he hid it again. And then in his joy, he sold all that he had and bought that field. 
Verse 45, again, the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant looking for fine pearls. When he found one of great value, he went away and sold everything he had and bought it. Now, quick question here. How many of you have heard one of these parables or both these parables in some form before? Anybody? Yeah, mo most of us have encountered this. And, and I had experience with these parables over the years as well. But as I was preparing for this message, I listened to probably a couple dozen different sermons and read a bunch of commentaries on these three verses. And here's the deal. 99% of every resource that I came across came up with the, the exact same conclusion about what these parables actually mean what they're supposed to mean. In fact, if you were to ask most Christians what, what Jesus meant by these two stories, that they would come back with you, come back to you with almost the exact same conclusion, which is this, that we, as followers of Jesus, that we are the man and we are the merchant in these parables. And what Jesus is saying is that we should be willing to give up everything for the kingdom. That we should be willing to, to give it all for the sake of the church, to give it all for the sake of the cause, to be willing to sell, be willing to give up everything for Jesus' sake. That, that's the traditional understanding of these verses, and that's almost unanimously the conclusion drawn by, preacher, drawn by preachers about these particular parables. But, 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 I'm not convinced that's correct. I'm not convinced that's correct. I would say they're, they're not wrong. They're not wrong. It's true. We should be willing to do that. We should be willing to give it all when we follow Jesus. I, I don't think they're wrong, but I don't know that they're right in getting that idea from this passage. I mean, if you want to make that point, there's lots of places in the Bible that sort of say that, that tell us that's what we should do. You, you can read, deny yourself and take up your cross. You can read, sell your belongings and give to the poor. Love the Lord with, with every aspect of your being, your mind, your heart, your soul, your strength. Jesus said all those things. And he says that, but I don't think that's what he's saying here. And, here, and here's why. You got to remember the context. You see, when it, when it comes to unlocking some of these parables, specifically this particular parable, these two, when it comes to unlocking them, context is crucial. Context is key. And the context for these two stories is found in Matthew chapter 13. And in this chapter, there is a collection of three related parables. In fact, the last three sermons here at center point deal with these three parables that are just before what we just read. Um, the parable of the sower, the parable of the wheat and weeds, and the parable of the mustard seed. And in every one of those parables, all three of those parables, there's a specific format that gets followed. All, it's all the same. There's a man, there's a field, and then there's an object of that man's attention. And so after Jesus delivered these series of stories, the disciples, confused per their use, asked Jesus to help them understand what he just said to better understand the meaning behind his metaphor of the parable of the sower. So a little earlier in verses 37 and 38, Jesus breaks it down for them. And you can check it out later if you want, but Jesus essentially says that the man, the, the seed sower, the man is God. The man is the Lord. The man is Jesus. And then the field in the, each of these stories is the world. And then the object of the man's attention is the daughters and the sons of the kingdom. That's the format. That's the format that each of those three parables follows. And that's the format that leads up to verse 44, which is why it seems so odd to me that when we hit the hidden treasure and the pearl of great price stories, we invert it. We invert it. And instead of understanding God, the Lord Jesus, as the man or the merchant in these stories, we, we put ourselves in that place. But what if we're willing to take a second look at something we think we know? What, what if we follow the pattern of the other parables as Jesus describes and we look at the man and the merchant as Jesus? We look at the field as the world and then we look at us, you, me, we as the hidden treasure. What if we look at us as the pearl of great price? What if we look at it the way I believe Jesus designed it 
to be seen, for us to see it. I wonder if we might just discover something that we're missing that's very important and that something that we're missing might just change everything. And so that's what I wanna do. I wanna look at this parable in the way that I think Jesus wants us to see it, which is you and me, we as the treasure. Now, when we do that, I don't know about you, but for me, it causes all sorts of cognitive dissonance and additional questions like this. How in the world can God consider me to be a treasure? How, how does he consider me to be something or someone of incredible value? Especially when he knows me better than anybody. How does he think I'm a treasure? I mean, he knows me. He knows my past. He knows what I'm really like when no one's looking. He knows how I tend to treat people. He knows about all the mistakes that I've made, all the stupid stuff that I've done, all the things that I've thought, all the places I've been, all the tentless camping trips I've been on. Like he knows about all this stuff. And he considers me a treasure. I mean, if this parable is true and it's to be interpreted this way, and I am and you are and we are that important to God, the inevitable question becomes, what's so special about you? Like, what's so special about me? Why does he consider us that way? To be a treasure, to be a pearl of great price. Well, to answer that, we have to go back. We have to go way, way back. In fact, we have to go all the way back to the very beginning of it all. So if you still have your Bible or your Bible app open, I wanna invite you to join me uh, in a different location. I want you to go back to the very beginning, to the very first chapter of the very first book of the Bible, the very first uh, book called Genesis. Now you can just go to page one. If, you're, if you don't know exactly where it's at, just go to page one. Um, and we're gonna look at that. We're gonna look at this. Um, and, and it's a little risky to do that because chapter one of Genesis is about creation and creation for many people is, is quite controversial. And in fact, for many people, this chapter of the Bible comes with a trigger warning <laughs> and it's, it's something we can debate and it's something we can discuss. We can do that. We can discuss all the details uh, about the days and about dinosaurs and about did Adam and Eve have belly buttons, you know, like really important stuff like that. You know, I think a lot about that. Um, we can discuss the details about chapter one, but one thing we cannot argue about is the fact that what God did in creation was absolutely amazing. I mean, that's, that's quite honestly one of the things that I love so much about summertime is our ability to take a chance and step outside and see all the, the God wonders that are everywhere all around us all the time. If we're able to open up our eyes and our ears and to see what's around us like the stars that shine at night, you know, the ones that we can see on a, on a clear night and especially the ones that we're just now seeing. I don't know, but have you seen the pics from the new James Webb uh, Space Telescope? I, I can go down the rabbit hole of this forever. I mean, this thing's amazing. Uh, it, it is picking up stars that we have never seen before. Stars, in fact, that have been sending their light toward us near the beginning of time. It's amazing. But the awe-inspiring nature of creation is not, is not just out there. Creation is awe-inspiring right here on this planet as well. In fact, a few years ago in Forbes magazine, they published an article called The Most Beautiful Places in the World. And in this article, they listed places and then they published high-res pictures of locations like Rio de Janeiro, Brazil, places like Tuscany, Italy, beautiful places like Mount Everest, Nepal, and Torres del Plain National Park in Patagonia, Chile, it, including what, what some have considered to be maybe even the eighth wonder of the world, Mount Rumke of Cincinnati, Ohio. <clears throat> While many consider that to be the eighth wonder of the world, uh, it is also the eighth largest landfill in the United States. Now, if you were to go to any one of these situations, these locations uh, on the Forbes list, with the exception of maybe the last one, um, you're gonna be impressed. You're gonna be impressed. You, you might even vocalize your awe and amazement at, at this aspect of God's creation by saying, wow, that's spectacular. That's incredible. 
You'd probably do that. But here's what's cool. Here's what's cool. Any response that we might have to this aspect of God's creation is going to pale in comparison to his creation of human beings. Check out how it's described. Genesis chapter one, verse 26 reads like this. Then God said, let us make man in our image according to our likeness. They will rule the fish of the sea, or at least attempt to, right? (laughs) They will rule the birds of the sky, the livestock, the whole earth, and the creatures that crawl on the earth. Look at verse 27. This is incredible. So God created humans in his own image. He created man, mankind in his own image. He created him in the image of God. He created them male and female. It's a little poem there at the end of chapter one. And what do these verses mean? Well, simply this. Humanity is the pinnacle of God's creation. I don't know if you know that. Humanity is the pinnacle of God's creation. It's the pinnacle. It's the height. It's the peak. It's the apex. It's the zenith. The raddest, most awesomest, high five and dunk the football over the goalposts of God's accomplishments. And if you've ever been present, when a, when a human is made, when a baby is born, you, you know that's true. You know that's true. You know why they call it the miracle of birth. I know this. I know this experience is true from the birth of my own daughter, Gianna. I mean, I'll, I'll never forget the moment where I first held her in my arms. I remember thinking because I was speechless. I remember thinking to myself, wow, this is incredible. She's absolutely amazing. I mean, I was, I was in awe of the fact that I could literally see myself in the face of this little miracle. And I'm so, so glad someone was able to snap a photo of her in that moment. It's my face and that little baby. It's just so, isn't she lovely? Isn't she lovely? Why? Why are you laughing at my daughter? Just kidding. No, that's just kidding. The miracle will be that she grows up and doesn't look like me. Uh, Here's the actual moment. It's just so beautiful. It's so beautiful. You see, the the thing that makes humanity so stinking unique, that the pinnacle of God's creation is not just our image as parents in the face of our children, but rather the image of God God in all of us. You see, God didn't give his image to any other thing that he created. And and that's the first reason why God considers us to be a treasure, why, why we have incredible value and worth for him. Number one, the value of something is determined by who made it, whether it's a purse or a gun or a car or whatever, or a human, it's true. The value of something is determined by who made it. And God made us. We are made by him in his image. That's the first reason. There's there's a second reason as well. I wanna show it to you. Skip down a little bit further into chapter two. Chapter two, verse four continues this story of creation. It says this. These are the records of the heavens and the earth concerning their creation. And I just want to pause here because right now, smack dab in the middle of this verse, we're entering a new view of creation. Genesis 1 is kind of all about this high view. And then what happens next is that you slowly begin to zoom in on one specific moment in in chapter 2. Look at it in the rest of verse 7. At that moment, the Lord God made the heavens and the earth. No shrub in the field had yet grown on the land. No plant of the field had yet sprouted. For the Lord had not made it rain on the land. And there was no man to to work the ground, but mist would come up from the earth and water the ground. You can see it begin to zoom into one specific moment in this verse seven. Then the Lord God formed the man out of the dust of the ground. Now, if you are an in your Bible writer kind of person, I would encourage you to circle, to underline, to highlight that word formed. It's an awesome word here because it gives us incredible insight into our value to God. In, in Hebrew, the word formed is the word yitzir. Say yitzir. That's, I came back to speak to you. That's the best you got for me. Yitzir. That was mildly better. Okay, thank you. Um, now, yitzir is a very unique word because it describes creation, but it's only used of humans. And it describes the slow, calculated, gradual process of creation that is accomplished with incredible accuracy and precision. 
Uh, Yitzir is a word that's used in other ancient documents to describe the process of a potter taking his time to form a vessel into the perfect, flawless shape. And that's the word that was chosen here to describe the Lord God creating man from the dust of the ground. Okay, now let's think back for just a minute. In chapter one of Genesis, how did God create everything that we see and experience in this world? How did he do it? He spoke. He said, let there be. Let there be light. Let there be this. Let there be that. Let there be this. Let there be that. He used his words. He used his voice. But with humanity, he did it differently. Which is the second reason why you and I are such a treasure to him. Because number two, the value of something is not only determined by who made it, but also by how it's made. And when God made human beings, hear this, how did he do it? He used his hands. Humanity is handcrafted by God. The creator, this expert craftsman created you and created me as a divinely handmade work of art. And this part of creation is so different from the rest of creation because it was so personal for God. You see, the point of this image, this Yitzir image, is that God created us in his image, but he did it intimately. God intimately created us in his image. This was a close encounter of the divine kind. And interestingly, the, the intimacy doesn't end there. Look at it again in verse 7. Look at how God did it. We created humanity. It's, it's even more intimate than that. Verse seven, then the Lord God formed Yitzir, handcrafted man out of the dust of the ground. Look at this, look at this. And he breathed the breath of life into his nostrils and the man became a living being. So intimate, right? I mean, maybe, maybe, just maybe, the miracle of birth, the human being, being created moments, those moments, maybe they take our breath away because it first took God's breath away as well. You see the image here is of God face to face, nose to nose with humanity, breathing out just as humans are breathing in. You see God intimately created us in his image. Yet I would say the sad reality of all of this is that people don't see the value in this truth about God, let alone see the significance of their own existence. Because the value of something is determined by who made it, how it's made, but there's one more. And if you miss the first two, don't miss this last one. The value of something is determined by what someone's willing to pay for it. And maybe that's why you're here today, to hear that today, to hear that in the parable of the hidden treasure and in the parable of the pearl of great price and in Genesis 1 and in Genesis 2, Jesus is saying to you, I just want you to see what I see. About God in this parable, absolutely. But just as importantly, in yourself as well. Because when I see you, Jesus says, I see a treasure. I see someone made by God in his image. I see someone expertly handcrafted by the creator of it all. And I see, Jesus said, someone that I was willing to give my life for. I see someone I was willing to pay the ultimate price for. And if you can't bring yourself to believe that you're valuable because of who made you or how you were made, then Jesus says, just look at the cross. Just look at the cross and let it tell you how much you're worth. Because the value of something is determined by what someone's willing to pay for it. And friends, that, that's why we need to take a second look at something we think we know. 
think we already know about the parable? Yeah, maybe. But maybe even more importantly about ourselves. We need to take a second look because we might be missing something that might just change everything. And if you never look, you'll never know. Which is why I think Jesus, as he was heading to the cross, he had his disciples pause for a moment, for a meal to remember. In fact, as they gathered together that night that he was betrayed, he took the bread and he broke it and he said, this bread, it represents my body that's been broken for you. Every time you eat of this, I want you to do something specific. He said, I want you to remember me. Not, not just what I did, but also what it means. And what it means is that you're worth it. And then he took the cup and he blessed the cup and he said, this cup represents my blood that will be spilt for you. It represents a new way that you're gonna relate with God. And every time you drink of this cup, I want you to do something very specific. I want you to remember me, not just what I did, but why I did it, because you're worth it. And so every week here, we pause to give ourselves a space and a place to do that, to remember. And so as we take communion together today, I just wanna offer you a moment to take a second look at something that you might think you know, because you might've missed something, or you might need to remember something. And that something might just change everything. But if you never look, you never know. So we're gonna partake in this moment together. The ushers, if you don't have communion, just raise your hand. They would love to pass uh, one of those out to you. Um, but while we do that, just take a moment and spend some time with God and allow Him to show you through the cross how much you mean to Him, how valuable you are to Him. Allow Him to show you the treasure that you truly are. Let's pray together. God, we thank you for this moment. And God, we are in awe of your created world. All the things that we see, all the things that we can't see, God, we know that you in your wisdom and power have made it all. And it is wonderful. And God, we are humbled by the fact that humanity for you is the pinnacle of your creation because we have your image in all of us. And God, we have value because you made us with your hands and you paid for us with your life. And so God, we give you these next few moments as an opportunity to remember take a second look at something we think we know because that something could change everything so God we thank you for Jesus who made all that possible and it's in his wonderful name that we pray and all God's people said